promise you a very fine program and a good lecture by a very well-known author and writer. Uh, later on, uh, when the time comes to introduce him, I'll call on Steve Lamejo uh, to make the introduction. Steve is on the board of trustees of the FDR Library and has been helpful uh, not only in this instance, but in uh, other instances of obtaining uh, authors and writers who have been connected with or have spoken at the FDR Library. Steve and I go there uh, often. Now, tonight we have a number of new people. Uh, may, may I ask for a show of hands of those who are who here for the first time? Oh. Yeah. 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 Normally, I ask the people to individually stand up and tell us how they heard about the program, but there's just too many new people here tonight. So uh, I suspect that it is because uh, of a number of reasons, one of which was uh, in order to uh, spread the word about this lecture tonight and Richard Brightman, uh, I, I uh, prepared and issued a, a comprehensive uh, press report and I delivered it personally to the five synagogues in this area that I know uh, by name and I've been to at various occasions. And we also were pleased to find that the Jewish News uh, published a notice of this uh, lecture tonight. Uh, and it's a very large crowd, but at dinner tonight, uh, Richard told me that he spoke in Detroit, uh, what, a few weeks ago? Uh, about a month ago, a few weeks. And he had a crowd of 450 people. Wow. wow. Uh, so that's amazing. Uh, but may I ask the, the various synagogues that are represented here tonight, because I want to see if my uh, trip to them uh, paid dividends. <laughs> <laughs> what synagogues do we have represented here tonight? I know there's some tonight Jeshua people here, right? Okay. Sherry uh, to fellow Israel. Which one? Sherry to fellow Israel. Okay, what else? B'nai Israel Milburn. Okay. <laughs> Abraham. Thank you. Abraham. Now, uh, did the synagogues announce this at Friday night service or post it on a bulletin board? Or how, how did you get notice of it? Email. Email. Wonderful. I want to thank the uh, directors of the various synagogues for their cooperation. Uh, since there are a number of people here tonight for the first time, I'm going to spend a moment to tell you a little bit about the World War II Club. <laughs> How long have we been in existence? What we do? A little louder. Yeah. You can't hear. No, yeah, you louder? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, since there are a number of people here for the first time, uh, I'm going to spend a minute or two telling you about the World War II Club, how it started, and what we've been doing for the last six years. Uh, we hold monthly lectures on subjects related to World War II authors and historians, either one, who are knowledgeable about World War II. And over the past six years, we've had a number of uh, well-known uh, authors, and uh, uh, for those people who are interested, you can go to our website, because all of these lectures are videotaped. I have two young men from the Milburn High School uh, who are in training, uh, they want to be videographers, and they're well on their way to learning how to do that with a lot of help from knowledgeable people. And we post these, we post these um, lectures on the website, New Jersey World War II Book Club. You can look it up on Google, and you can pull up any of the past lectures uh, that we've had. Uh, we'd be delighted to have any of the new people uh, join us. The dues are nominal. $25 a person, $30 for a family. Uh, but I have to tell you that the, these modest dues uh, do not come anywhere near covering the expenses, particularly of bringing authors in uh, from out of town with their expenses and hotel. So, I'm not a bit bashful about saying, uh, and if we didn't have uh, some of our members who 
donate a good deal more than the, than the dues, we wouldn't be able to put these programs on. I think we, I think there's some the chairs in the back. Go ahead. I think there's some chairs in the back. Uh, so, uh, those of you who feel inclined, if you're pleased with the program, we'd be happy to have you join, and we'd be happy to have you uh, help us defer part of the expenses. We have these lectures 10 months a year. Uh, July and August, there are no lectures. So there's one more lecture this season, which also is going to be a very good one. Uh, Monday, and it's only Monday, it's a rare for us to have it on Monday because of a scheduling problem with the author. Her name is Susan Butler. Uh, she's written several books and she's coming out with a new one. But the book she's going to talk about and lecture on is My Dear Mr. Stalin. It is the first and only complete collection of correspondence between FDR and Stalin, and it is a remarkable series of letters and communications, and just by skimming these letters and going through them, you can see the evolution of the relationship between these two leader, world leaders and how uh, friendship turned into skepticism and worse at the end. And Susan Butler uh, not only has the um, letters in her book, uh, she has some excellent commentary uh, which uh, gives a lot of insight into what was going on. Now before I call on Steve Lamezo, uh, who is a, a member of the uh, board of directors of the, of, of the FDR library, uh, I just want to mention that um, the subject tonight, which I'm sure is in large measure responsible for people coming here tonight, uh, is a subject on which uh, historians have disagreed since 1945, and they still continue to disagree. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that the two major points of anti-Roosevelt that have been raised, not only by Jewish people, but uh, by many others, uh, is the uh, refusal of FDR to approve or give support to the landing of the 900 some odd people that came over from uh, Germany on the St. Louis. And also we hear oftentimes comments on why didn't FDR approve bombing of the rail lines, particularly those into Auschwitz. Uh, we will hear about that tonight. And in a sense, you're sitting here as a jury. Hopefully some of you have done some reading on this. Uh, if you really want to know more about it, uh, please purchase a copy of Mr. Brightman's book, which is here. Uh, I don't know if I have enough copies for everybody. I, we only bought about 15 or 20. Uh, but uh, yeah. when it's through, you, the members of the jury, can make up your own mind about those two issues and any other issues which Richard will talk about. And now it's my pleasure to ask my good friend, Dr. Steve Lamezo, to introduce Richard Brightman. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I, I, I want to mention that the man to my right has a little bit of energy. Um, <laughs> uh, he's really my hero because when, when I am um, whatever, uh, I want to be doing what he's doing. Next month he's off to China for a seminar on uh, uh, American involvement in World War II. Uh, so uh, this man has incredible energy and this room is a tribute to him. I'm very proud to be called his friend. Uh, to, to get to the point that hey, now we are honored tonight, oh, by the way, the FDR Library. Um, if anybody wants a really fun evening at the library, this Friday night they're actually having an old-time USO show at the library in Hyde Park, uh, which is open to the public for free. And on Saturday there's going to be some reenactments from World War II, 
So, uh, not, not the battles, but, but soldiers, etc. <laughs> so I think you might enjoy going up there. We also uh, check your website for the FDR Reading Day, uh, which is a, a reading festival. The, the, the lead speaker is going to be Daniel Tobin, who uh, wrote a wonderful book, which is a definitive work on FDR and polio, and the effect of polio on him and his personality and how he achieved the presidency with polio. Okay, without further ado, we are honored tonight to have a world-class a historian and speaker, Richard Brightman. Uh, he, I asked him what he wanted to be to say, and he said as little as possible, so I'm trying to honor his wishes. Uh, understand that Dr. Brightman is, uh, uh, is of Yale and is of Harvard, and is, in his current position is Distinguished Professor of uh, History at American University. The book itself, to this point, won the 2013 Tikkun Olam Award um, for FDR and the Jews. He was a finalist at the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in History for this book, and the, and, and the book won the National Jewish Book Award in 2013 in American Jewish Studies. So without further ado, I give you Professor Richard David Wright. Thank you very much. Uh, Oh, that's great, Steve. Uh, thanks very much to John McLaughlin for making all of these uh, arrangements and inviting me and to Steve Lameso and to all the members of the New Jersey World War II Book Club. How's that? And to all of you who are intending to join in the New Jersey World War II Book Club. <laughs> we okay on the on the volume? No. No. <laughs> Testing. One, two, three. Yes. All right, let's try that. This book came out about a year ago, and from the beginning generated a fair amount of attention. This is a difficult subject. It's a subject that involves a lot of pain for a lot of people. And my co-author and I understood that. We make judgments, some positive, some negative, about Franklin Roosevelt in this book. But our foremost intention was to try to explain why Roosevelt did what he did, when he did, uh, and why he didn't do some things. So um, it's not meant as a book to praise Roosevelt, to apologize for Roosevelt, and it's not meant as a savage attack on everything about Franklin Roosevelt. Let me illustrate this with a story. I got an email after publication from someone whom I didn't know who said he had it on good authority that in 1943, Franklin Roosevelt was presented with aerial photographs of the extermination camps. He knew where the camps were, he knew what they were doing, and he did nothing about it. I wrote back and said, in effect, a little more politely, that's totally impossible because American planes could not reach the extermination camps in 1943, let alone take photographs. He wrote back and said, well, maybe it was 1944. <laughs> and then I said, all of the extermination camps except Auschwitz-Birkenau had shut down by 1944. And he said, well, okay, so it was Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I said, uh, are you aware that 
in the late 1970s, a photoanalyst for the CIA went through some old files and uncovered some photographs, aerial photographs of Birkenau, the extermination uh, camp at Auschwitz, and magnified them. And there was a front page article in the Washington Post about it uh, because nobody in photo analysis, photo reconnaissance analysis during the war had done this. And the man, in fact, wrote an article for a historical journal about why the photo analyst during the war failed to identify the extermination camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. <coughs> At that point, the correspondence ceased. But this tells us something. This tells us that people have studied the Holocaust. They think they know things about the Holocaust. And they are attuned to the moral lessons of the Holocaust. But they do not all study the Second World War in the same way. And unless you understand the connection between the Holocaust and the war on the Nazi side and on the American side, you can't really judge behavior very well. So what I have done tonight is to take one small slice of this book. The book, I will say as briefly as I possibly can, treats Franklin Roosevelt from birth to death, his relationship with American Jews as well as with the issues related to European Jews. It's a broad canvas. Tonight, I'm dealing with one small part and not even a chapter, I'm taking portions from different chapters in order to eliminate uh, the connection between the Holocaust and the war in Washington. If you see that connection, you will understand Franklin Roosevelt a little better. You may still judge him very harshly. That is your right. But we want people to judge Roosevelt based on the facts and not based on myths or misbeliefs. So let me start by talking about information about the Holocaust that was coming out uh, at the time and making an impact on this side of the Atlantic. There were, of course, reports from the beginning of the war in the East, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, that Nazi forces were slaughtering Jews. There were reports in the Jewish press and occasionally in the mainstream press. But the Nazis were committing lots of atrocities in lots of places. And for most people, there was not enough information from solid sources for anybody to forecast what was really <coughs> taking place. By the summer of 1942, the numbers got much larger. There were reports in uh, the British press of 700,000 Jews in Poland being killed or dying. And then came the single most important piece of evidence on this side of the Atlantic. In August 1942, a man by the name of Gerhard Rietner, representative of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, sent a telegram to London and to Washington warning that Hitler's headquarters was considering a plan to exterminate three and a half to four million Jews 
with the use of prussic, a gas based on prussic acid, which was, in fact, the gas being used at Auschwitz-Birkenau. <coughs> with this technique, uh, Hitler was going to resolve the Jewish question in Europe once and for all. Well, this was qualitatively different information. Regner wanted to get this information to his superiors in the World Jewish Congress in Britain and in the United States. And he wanted to get the information to the British and American governments. And in fact, he went to British and American diplomats in Switzerland and asked them to send this telegram for him because it would go in code and it would go quickly and it would alert the governments. He, of course, also wanted it to go to the head of the World Jewish Congress in Britain and to Rabbi Stephen Wise, the head of the American Jewish uh, Congress in New York. He took the precaution of telling Silverman in London, you better send this to Wise just in case. Why was that? Silverman was a member of parliament. He wasn't just a Jewish official. Rabbi Wise was a private American citizen. Regner was not confident that this telegram would get through to Rabbi Wise. And in fact, when it went into the bureaucracy of the State Department, State Department officials looked at it and one of them wrote, I don't believe this. And even if it turns out to be true, there's nothing we can do about it. So I advise against sending it on to Rabbi Wise. The State Department sat on the information. Silverman, however, got his telegram and sent a private telegram, which took a while, to Wise. And so Wise got the telegram from Reitner a month later than it was intended. And the first thing he did was to rush down to Washington to ask the State Department about the accuracy of this information. But he went to the top. He went to the number two man in the State Department, the Under Secretary of State, a man named Sumner Wills. Some of you may remember that name. Wells was, in many ways, more important than the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull. Wells was FDR's man in the State Department. They had known each other a very long time, and Roosevelt had assisted Wells's rise up the State Department hierarchy. When we have no direct information about Roosevelt's reactions, and unfortunately that is true a fair amount of the time, we can use Wells' reactions as a kind of proxy for Roosevelt. Wells said to Wise, he didn't believe this report from Regner because the Nazis were short of labor why in the world would they be killing millions of Jews when they needed labor? Wise said, can we be reassured? And Wells answered, who can tell when you're dealing with that madman, meaning Hitler? So Wells said, let me investigate. And he asked Wise not to publicize the information until the investigation was concluded. He did, in fact, launch an investigation. 
probably not even knowing what his own subordinates had already done and said. <clears throat> Namely, that they didn't believe it and that they didn't want to send it to Wise. The investigation took considerable time. The American minister in Switzerland was asked to meet with Riegner and his colleague from the Jewish Agency for Palestine and to see what their sources were. He wrote back, well, they've got a lot of information. They've collected a great deal of information. Uh, Wells asked the American envoy to the Vatican to see what information the Vatican had. The Vatican was not terribly helpful. Myron Taylor, the American envoy to the Vatican, uh, came back to the United States, met with the president about his efforts to get information out of the Vatican and to get the Pope to say something about Nazi atrocities. He also suggested that the president might speak out and that might lead to a statement by the Pope. That was October 20th. 1942. What was FDR doing? What else was he concerned with then? On October 21st, he met with Rear Admiral Henry Kent Hewitt and a name you will recognize, Major General George S. Patton to discuss the launch of Operation Torch, the invasion of French Algeria and Morocco, with the ultimate goal, control of North Africa from the Atlantic to the Red Sea. Their most important short-term goal was to capture Tunisia, especially the, point, the port of Tunis, which was only a hop, skip, and a jump <coughs> away from Sicily, but landing in Tunisia was too risky. American troops at this time were totally untested. The president wanted U.S. ground troops in action in the calendar year 1942, and an invasion of the continent of Europe was judged to be far too risky. He hoped originally for an American operation in North Africa because the French, more or less allied with Germany, might not resist an American invasion the way they would a British invasion. But in the end, the British wanted in, and it turned out to be an Anglo-American project. In mid-October 1942, Winston Churchill said, if Operation Torch fails, I am done for. The commander-in-chief of the operation was Dwight D. Eisenhower. Years later, he wrote that the hours he spent in Gibraltar waiting for the start of Operation Torch were his most excruciating hours of the entire war, worse than before D-Day. And there was another crucial theater in North Africa at the same time. On October 23rd began the Second Battle of El Alamein. If Germany won that battle, its forces would have penetrated way into Egypt, taking the Suez Canal, and in all likelihood, moving into Palestine. It is worth reminding ourselves that in the beginning of November 1942, the Axis powers still seem to be winning the war. Roosevelt had hoped that Operation Torch could begin before 
the November 1942 elections. When that proved impossible for military reasons, he accepted the situation. <clears throat> Operation Torch against French forces reminds us that Vichy France on the continent had already begun cooperating with Nazi Germany in deporting Jews from France proper. And Vichy authorities in North Africa had enacted discriminatory laws against 330,000 Jews in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. American diplomats urged the White House and the State Department to do something about Nazi deportations. The American Charge d'Affaires in France was particularly eager to save ch Jewish children whose parents had already been deported to the East. Only admission to the United States, only visas, might save their lives. The State Department proposed to issue 1,000 visas. In early October 1942, the President raised the number to 5,000. But Wells asked the Jewish organizations not to publicize this decision. <coughs> At a mid-October press conference, a reporter asked Wells about this decision. Wells equivocated. He lied. He said that they were of no particular race or nationality, that private organizations were involved, and that the children would come in under regular immigration laws and procedures. Nonetheless, Newspaper articles were published. The premier of Vichy, France, Pierre Laval, was enraged. He decided that France would only release bona fide orphans. He was, in effect, saying these children were not orphans. Their parents had merely been resettled to Eastern Europe. What happened to these children? Following the start of Operation Torch, Germany sent troops into the unoccupied portion of France, weakening France's authority and barring the departure of Jewish children. Some 500 or so were smuggled into Spain and Portugal and some of them, along with children in North Africa, were, labeled, were later able to come to the United States on those 5,000 visas that were authorized, but nothing like 5,000, several hundred. A few minutes ago, I mentioned the midterm elections. The Democrats lost 47 seats in the House nine seats in the Senate, they barely held control of the House. A coalition of Republicans and right-wing Democrats held the balance of power. The President, as powerful as he was, had limited influence on Congress. <clears throat> the invasion came five days later, November 8th. The French fought. But eventually, French forces retreated, and the Allies gained their foothold in Morocco and in Algeria. German troops occupied Tunisia, and it was to be many months before Allied forces were able uh, to move into uh, Tunisia itself. On the other side of North Africa, 
the Second Battle of El Alamein ended with General Rommel's retreat, a victory by General Montgomery, and a Nazi force called Einsatzkommando Egypt, a mobile killing squad which had already been formed, was not able to move into Palestine as they had hoped, where there were close to 600,000 Jews. Part of the reason for the British victory in Egypt was that President Roosevelt had diverted 300 Sherman tanks from a planned shipment to the Soviet Union to British forces in Egypt. They were better tanks than anything that Rommel had. Mm. On November 18, 1942, General Eisenhower wrote, if we don't get to Tunisia quickly, we surrender the initiative, give the Axis time to do as it pleases in that region, encourage all our enemies individually and collectively. This battle is not, repeat, not won. On November 20th, I'm going chronologically, shifting from area to area, on November 20th, Premier Laval gave a speech in which he expressed France's hope for a German victory in the war to prevent communists and Jews from gaining control of France and extinguishing French civilization. Back in Washington, President Roosevelt had already asked Congress to pass a third War Powers Act, which contained a provision authorizing the president to suspend laws and regulations hampering the free movement of persons, property, and information in and out of the United States. We don't know why that provision was in there. We do know why it was taken out. The House Ways and Means Committee was worried that the president would use this clause to open the doors to unrestricted immigration. <clears throat> they took it out. In late November, the president tried to persuade House and Senate leaders to put it back in. The Speaker of the House said no, and the president backed off. This was the context, the political context, the military context, the diplomatic context, in which Sumner Wells called Rabbi Stephen Wise back, asked him to come to Washington, and said, our investigation confirms your deepest fears. He continued, for reasons that you will understand, I cannot give these to the press, but there is no reason that you should not it might even help if you did. <coughs> I cannot give these to the press. There were plenty of reports from the State Department itself, from the Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor of the CIA, from the Office of War Information, and from military intelligence that all too many Muslims in North Africa saw the Allies as fighting a war on behalf of the Jews. In late November, Assistant Secretary of State Burley wrote in his diary, only God knows whether the Arab tribes will rise. When General Eisenhower made it to Algiers, he found rumors there that he was Jewish <laughs> and that he was sent by the Jew Roosevelt to establish a Jewish state, not in Palestine, 
but in North Africa. Surely, this was one of the major reasons why Wells felt he could not speak out directly about what we have come to see as the Holocaust. We can study the Holocaust in retrospect. We can see how it developed. President Roosevelt had to deal with a wide range of issues, military, political, moral, all at the same time. He didn't see the Holocaust the way we study the Holocaust today. He saw a broader effort against an evil empire of which killings of Jews were a part. So what happened? Wise, liberated, immediately held a press conference. He publicized Rigner's telegram and other information that Jewish organizations had collected. He alluded to the fact that a State Department investigation had confirmed this information, even though a lot of subordinate State Department officials were not privy to what Wells had done and proceeded to deny that they had confirmed this information. Wise got greater publicity than any previous effort had obtained. But even so, the New York Times put the story on page 10. The Washington Post put it on page 6. The Los Angeles Times was the best of the major papers putting it on page 2. Around the same time, the now famous uh, Polish courier Jan Karski surfaced in London with his own reports about Nazi killings and gassings of Jews. This put pressure on the British to make a statement as the Rigner Telegram put pressure on the White House to make a statement. So the two governments got together <clears throat> and began to negotiate the terms of what they could say. Roosevelt had a brief moment of hope that he could get out of this situation easily. On December 5th, 1942, the Prime Minister of Canada was visiting the White House and Roosevelt told him that the German situation resembled that of 1917, 1918. Germany might crumble at any moment. But Roosevelt had misread the lessons of World War I and was way, way too optimistic about what North Africa was going to do to German troops. Even as he spoke, hardened German troops counterattacked in North Africa, and the battle dragged on for months. On December 8, 1942, happened to be the first anniversary of Roosevelt's date of infamy speech about Pearl Harbor. Four American Jewish representatives entered the Oval Office at noon. The president sat behind his cluttered desk smoking a cigarette. He greeted Rabbi Wise, the only one whom he knew personally, and Wise introduced the others. One of the others was an Orthodox rabbi who led the group in a prayer. Wives then read a portion of a memorandum with attached documents about the Nazi policy of exterminating the Jews of Europe. He appealed to FDR to bring this to the world's attention 
and to make an effort to stop it. Roosevelt responded, the government of the United States is very well acquainted with most of the facts you are now bringing to our attention. Unfortunately, we have received confirmation from many sources. Representatives of the United States government in Switzerland and other neutral countries have given up proof that confirm the horrors discussed by you. So he knew what Wells had done and what Wells' investigation had found. We cannot treat these matters in normal ways. We are dealing with an insane man, Hitler, and the group that surrounds him represents an example of a national psychopathic case. It is not in the best interest of the Allied cause to make it appear that the entire German people are murderers or are in agreement with what Hitler is doing. There must be in Germany elements now thoroughly subdued, but who at the proper time will, I am sure, rise and protest against the atrocities, against the whole Hitler system. It is too early to make pronouncements such as President Wilson made. But as to your proposal, I shall be glad to issue another statement such as you request. Uh, we know all of this. I could read a verbatim account because one of the Jewish representatives present uh, reconstructed the whole meeting. When Roosevelt asked the delegation for other suggestions, one suggested asking neutral countries to intercede with Germany on behalf of Jews. There wasn't much else that anybody could suggest to stop the killing. And the United States and Britain militarily were not capable of doing anything more than they were actually doing in North Africa. And they were having a tough go in North Africa. The discussion in the White House didn't end. Roosevelt shifted to North Africa. He mentioned that he had given orders to free Jews from concentration camps there and to abolish species special laws against Jews. He then balanced this statement with another one, complaining that the French had discriminated against Muslims, too. They had fewer rights than Jews in North Africa. And there were 17 million Muslims and only about a million Jews. Roosevelt said, the United States would fight for equal rights for all. It was not in favor of greater rights for one group over another. A lot of people who have looked at this meeting and analyzed it from the perspective of the Holocaust have said Roosevelt was diverting attention from the main issue. I think that's not quite right. Roosevelt was telling those present what was on his mind. You don't need to see Franklin Roosevelt as an anti-Semite to explain why he did not speak out powerfully and forcefully. You need to see him as a juggler who had just taken on a new and very difficult task, the invasion of North Africa, and was worried about the consequences of failure. Roosevelt did ultimately speak out about the Holocaust, but it was not until early 1944 was much later when the balance 
of military forces had shifted substantially. So we are critical of Roosevelt for not reacting quicker and more forcefully. He relied on an Allied government statement issued on December 17, 1942, which for the first time recognized that Nazi Germany had a policy to wipe the Jewish people out of Europe, to wipe them off the face, the face of Europe. It was an important step. It launched Jewish organizations into consideration of what might be done in the way of relief and rescue. But it was not yet an American commitment to try to impede the Holocaust. There was no military way of impeding the Holocaust. So the debate about bombing Auschwitz, which some of you are interested in. That's a debate that takes place in the second half of 1944, not at the end of 1942. Is this a more favorable picture of Franklin Roosevelt? Well, it is for those who have read some of the literature describing Roosevelt as indifferent to the Holocaust. There were reasons why he did what he did. They may not be good enough reasons for many of you, but you don't have to see Roosevelt as an anti-Semite. Let me conclude by talking about another email we received. One of our correspondents said, you know, your last quote sums up the whole book. So let me read you that quote. In a retrospective on Franklin Roosevelt, published some two weeks after his death, Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter wrote that contemporaries, no less than later generations, have a claim on the legacy of world leaders. Fluctuations of historic judgment are the lot of great men, and Roosevelt will not escape it. But if history has its claims, so has the present. For it has been widely, wisely said that if the judgments of the time must be corrected by that of posterity, it is no less true that the judgments of posterity must be corrected by that of the time. That is what we tried to do, is to place Roosevelt in the context of his own time and his own problems. <coughs> I know that John uh, highlighted the uh, same story of the St. Louis. I will be happy to answer questions about the St. Louis story and anything else that you want to ask about, but I was mindful of the fact that this is the World War II book club and I wanted to give you an important slice of World War II. Okay. My name is Matilde Van Beniste and I'm a second generation survivor of the Holocaust from Greece. Um, had, um, Roosevelt spoken against what was happening in uh, Europe by the Germans. In Europe, we don't refer to them as Nazis, we call them Germans. Uh, two questions. Would Pope Pius have changed his policy, attitude uh, toward Germany? And would uh, Roosevelt be, uh, won the election? We can't say whether uh, Roosevelt speaking out would have forced or induced uh, Pope Pius XII to speak out, but I, I have to say I think it was unlikely. Uh, 
the Pope had uh, his own reasons for um, doing, saying what he did say and not saying uh, other things. And uh, I don't think the United States government was in a position to put enough pressure on him to change. Um, would Roosevelt have won the 1944 election? Uh, that was a ways off. Um, I, I, I do think you have to look at these. The Roosevelt was above all a politician, and you do have to look at his behavior in terms of his calculating the, the pluses and minuses. He was someone who, going way back, was aware of the level of anti-Semitism in the United States and was concerned about it, politically concerned about it, as well as morally concerned about it. Um, so would it have hurt him politically? Yes, it would have hurt him politically uh, had he spoken out earlier and more forcefully. Uh, do I think that was the single most decisive factor? Probably not in this particular case because I think his mind was focused on North Africa and he didn't want to do anything that would backfire in North Africa. Uh, maybe later, he was concerned more about the American political effects, uh, middle of 1943. Uh, he did eventually speak out, but it wasn't until 1944. Okay. Uh, I got lots of hate. Somebody wanna, all right, here first. Uh, okay. <laughs> you took the audience here back in history, but there was one element of history you didn't mention at all. My father was born in Kiev, Russia, and one of my cousins went back to Russia in the late 60s and found out that there were some Holocaust survivors. Okay. But you didn't mention the fact, when did Hitler attack Russia? What year? And what was it? 1941. 1941, okay. So, the German army, the people sitting on a fence, did the, uh, uh, did the Germans kill Jews? As they invaded Russia, they knocked off Jews left and right. So how come our ally, Russia, didn't tell the rest of the world, or Roosevelt didn't say, could you bring us up to date the way the people, which are Russian Jews <laughs> being treated? I think the people sitting on the border who didn't know if this was true or not would have changed their minds. Could you emphasize that, please? Uh, I'll rephrase the question. Uh, uh, Mr. Katz is quite correct that uh, with the German invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, SS and police forces followed the regular army and began to slaughter Jews in occupied territories in large numbers. We had some information about this taking place. I alluded to it early in my lecture. The problem was, on this side of the Atlantic, it wasn't entirely clear what, who the victims were and how large the killings uh, were becoming. The Nazis had carried out atrocities in France, they had carried out atrocities in the former Czechoslovakia, in Yugoslavia, in lots of places. And the kinds of reports that reached the press in this country were not sufficiently distinctive for people to say, most people to say, this is something categorically different. This is, this is part of an overall plan. That's why I emphasize the Regner telegram. Because Regner said, this is Hitler, this is not individual units, and this is part of an overall plan to eliminate Jews from Europe. Now, having said that, I will concede that Britain had better information. Why did Britain have better information? Because, as we now know, British intelligence was intercepting and decoding 
a portion of German radio messages sent to and from uh, the units in the East. And some of those messages talked about the killings of thousands of Jews here and there. Winston Churchill even gave a speech on August 24th, 1941. And if you read his very, uh, I won't use an adjective, his official biographer, Sir uh, Martin Gilbert, uh, Gilbert regards this speech as the first allied recognition of the Holocaust. If you look at the actual text of that speech, you will see that Churchill never mentions the word Jews. He said that Nazi police forces were slaughtering scores of thousands of Russian patriots. So you've got two choices. Either Churchill didn't yet know that the Nazi forces were concentrating on Jews, or he didn't want to say it. He talked about a crime without a name, but he didn't say it involved Jews. Yes. yes. Um, well, there were there were people throughout the populace of Europe and the United States that were quite anti-Semitic, and uh, they had power and sway. And so these people were doing a balancing act um, uh, because they had to deal with an incredible amount of anti-Semitism the world over at that point. Okay. It's more a comment than a question. Yes. There was, in fact, a problem of anti-Semitism in many countries of which Allied leaders were aware. They couldn't just wash it away. Whether that uh, justifies action or inaction, that's another issue that different people are going to judge in different ways. And, you know, throughout this book we talk about Roosevelt changing as conditions change. We talk about four phases of Franklin Roosevelt. Yes. I'd, like to, I'd like to make a comment to that first question. Use the microphone. Can you repeat the question? I'd like to repeat that first question. No, use the microphone. No, no, I'll talk louder. The first question was, what did the Pope, I think that one, refer to, do about the Jewish question? I can answer this question for one reason. I was there. I spoke with the Pope. He was doing what he had to do, just as Roosevelt was doing what he had to do. Otherwise, the Germans would have been killing all the Catholics. He, at that time, was ciphering in Jews, not a lot, but enough to know that we were doing something, or they, they were doing something for us. So I'd like to say, it's always been thinking, what did the Pope do? And as, as a Jewish boy, who was spoke with the Pope. I could tell you he was doing what he had to do. Yes. Have all American documents been declassified on this issue? Or could there still be stuff, uh, some material in Foggy Bottom in some of the rooms there that we haven't seen? All of the documents that we could possibly find related to these issues have been declassified. I was part of a big government effort following the passage of the law in 1998 to locate and declassify records uh, related to the Holocaust, uh, other kinds of persecution during World War II, and uh, post-war contacts or knowledge of war criminals. Uh, we declassified approximately 8 million pages of U.S. government records. Everything that we could find, we got declassified. Thank you. I realize that this is conjecture, but how bad do you think it would have had to be for Roosevelt to take more positive action to help the Jewish situation in Europe? In other words, he had some material from varied sources. 
from diplomatic sources. I'm sure there are a large number of people in this room right now who had families who were affected from a personal point of view. How bad do you think, or what would it have taken to get Roosevelt to take a more positive action? Okay, the question was what would have, uh, what would it have uh, taken to get Roosevelt to be more positive? Um, I now need to give a quick summary of the book uh, because your, your question assumes your question assumes that there was only one Franklin Roosevelt who was unhelpful, and in fact, we talk about four different phases of Franklin Roosevelt as president, two of which were unhelpful, and two of which were helpful. So. The Franklin Roosevelt, uh, following his re-election in 1936, was actually quite positive. This was, when he was re-elected in 1936, he thought it was his last term. He had done a great deal in domestic policy. He had done very little in foreign policy, and Congress wouldn't let him do much in foreign policy. The one thing that he thought he might be able to do something about was the refugee problem, which was the term he preferred <coughs> rather than the Jewish problem in Europe. And so he launched a series of initiatives which we describe in this book uh, during 1938, which resulted in the American immigration quota being filled for the first time. There was an international conference on refugee problems. The United States uh, pushed Latin American countries to take Jews in and hoped that other European countries with colonies would take Jews in. That second Roosevelt did not survive the start of the war. Once the war started, he shifted for reasons we go into in the book, and that third Roosevelt continued until the fall of 1943, and then Roosevelt looking at the military situation, begins to conclude that there was more that the government could do on behalf of European Jews. It took and them a long time. That is correct. That is correct. And it led in January 1944 to the establishment of a war refugee board, which most authorities say in the last year and a half of the war helped to save about 200,000 people. Britain never established a war refugee board and did not cooperate with the American War Refugee Board. So do you judge Roosevelt based on what he didn't do or what he did do? Different people will conclude different things. Yeah, I was a teenager at that time. My father was Russian. He did serve in the American Army in the First World War. And he insisted he take me to Russian newsreels in the early 40s, which were at the Stanley Theater on Broadway in New York City. And they already, I, I think it must have been about 42 or 43, showed these piles of bodies in concentration camps. I've always wondered why there was no more Americans' awareness for the press, or the radio at that time, of other people who must have seen this happen because I did as a kid, and it impressed me. Now, I brought this up uh, later on in my high school class, and I told my princi principal that I, I thought we ought to have some remembrance of what I had seen, and he said, not yet, not yet, not yet, or something like that. So they kept putting it off and putting it off at even the local level of Roselle High School in New Jersey, where I was raised. And I've always wondered about that. Other people, the, the evidence was there for all to see. I hope most of you heard that. I'm not going to try to repeat it all. Um, the um, issue of how to treat what at the time was called atrocity information was a very sensitive one in the United States government. Uh, there was a committee on war information that debated the issue and more or less concluded 
that atrocities against foreign <coughs> citizens that did little other than to excite horror was not in the interest of the Allies. If you look at a now famous documentary series called uh, Why, we Why We Fight, meant to illuminate the war to the American public and to soldiers, there is very little information in there about the Holocaust. And this was part of the, <coughs> the culture of the day, that there was so much anti-Semitism at home and abroad that the more you emphasize the Nazi killings of Jews, the more problems you caused in the pursuit of the war. You have to realize that Hitler and other Nazi leaders, that the whole Nazi press was saying or writing day after day that the Allies were only fighting the war because of the Jews. And in areas like North Africa and the Middle East, that kind of charge had some purchase. And Roosevelt and others did not want to add to the immediate problems. Yes. Would you say that uh, that was in his thinking when he turned back the ship to St. Louis? No. Uh, uh, let's go there. <laughs> OK, we, we now got to the St. Louis. <laughs> All right. This is, of course, before the war. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take at least five minutes on this. Please. Uh, OK. <laughs> People do not really understand uh, the story of the SS St. Louis. The story started after Kristallnacht. What happened? Two days after Kristallnacht, by coincidence, a great humanitarian statesman Fulgencio Batista was in the White House meeting with President Roosevelt. He was there to improve his own image and to try to get the United States to lower the tariff on Cuban sugar. We don't know what was said in the Oval Office, probably with Wells being a participant because Roosevelt never kept notes and didn't allow others to take notes of these meetings. But we do know what Batista said afterwards. He went to New York and gave a speech in which he said he would be very pleased to cooperate with President Roosevelt's efforts to do something about the terrible situation of refugees from Central Europe. And so from November, 1938 until May 1939, ship after ship left German ports with German and Austrian Jews going to Cuba with tourist visas, which they purchased. Why to Cuba? Because the American immigration quota was then filled. There was a waiting list of approximately 300,000. If people had to wait in Germany for their turn, they would never get out. But if they could get to Cuba, they could wait safely for their turn to get into the United States. And Batista was turning a profit from this business. By May 1939, there were somewhere between five and 6,000 German and Austrian Jewish refugees in Cuba. There was a backlash. Batista was not yet dictator. There were other powers. The president of Cuba didn't like the situation. And so as the St. Louis with 937 passengers sailed, the Cuban government said, these tourist visas are not good for long-term stay, and we're not going to allow any more tourists in. The ship had nowhere to go. Uh, I sometimes ask the audience, 
Um, so what happened to the passengers? And the most frequent answer I get is they went back to Germany. Not one passenger went back to Germany. The United States government negotiated with the European democracies and Britain, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands agreed to take in all of the passengers who were not allowed into Cuba. Actually, 20 some odd were allowed into Cuba because they had immigration visas. But all of the others <coughs> went to European democratic countries. This was a perfectly reasonable compromise in the summer of 1939. There was no war. There was no Holocaust. It was only later, when Germany conquered much of the continent, that some of them fell into jeopardy. Even so, people think they all died. They didn't all die. Two-thirds plus of the passengers survived, and about half of them ultimately ended up in the United States. That is the real story of the SS St. Louis. Question back there. Yeah, a lot of this information is informative, but thinking back, World War One, the Germans lose, they blame the Jews at the end of the war, which was the Jewish situation. And you're saying, well, the Allies, or, or Roosevelt, the United States, they couldn't emphasize helping the Jews, because that would, that would somehow put the Jews in a position uh, with the enemies that, that would give them uh, fodder, you know, they aren't supporting the Jews. I think the issue, for those of you who are Jewish, is how important are the Jewish people? I mean, in reality, what you're saying is there's this total war going on. There's this little group of people who have been traditionally had the help you out in Europe. And why are we expecting, why are you expecting Roosevelt to be different than the context of his times and maybe get back and forth? I think the real question is the Jews, they ask themselves what their role is wherever they are. Uh, I'm not sure that that requires an answer, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, keep in mind what I said at the beginning. This is a difficult subject. Different people will make different judgments. We don't expect that everybody will agree with our judgments. We identified our own judgments, but we want people to understand the times and to understand Roosevelt in the context of the times. And he did face a problem in that much of the country was less sympathetic on Jewish issues than he personally was. That was part of the political context. <coughs> he didn't have to do what he did in 1938 or 1939. He didn't have to establish a war refugee board in January of 1944. He did it when he thought he could now manage the political and military consequences. Was it too little, too late? Some people will say that. Different people will reach different judgments. Yeah. Uh, two more questions. At the and what about Raoul Wallenberg? He saved many Jews in Hungary, and wasn't he receiving support from the U.S. government in that enterprise? <coughs> that is correct. The War that. Refugee Board, set up in January of 1944, uh, which was really that's a story in and of itself, which we tell in the book. Uh, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau Jr. had a lot to do with that. Uh, took significant steps to save Jews in the last year and a half of the war, one of which was encouraging the Swedish government to send a special envoy to Hungary to try to rescue as many Hungarian Jews as possible. So the Wallenberg mission was a direct uh, enterprise of the War Refugee Board, which Roosevelt established. This is the fourth Roosevelt, which we talked about in the book. 
And one further comment, as far as the Pope is concerned, um, I think sometimes uh, we don't completely understand what was happening with the Pope. I mean, uh, you know, he was surrounded because at that time the uh, Germans controlled Rome, and I think he was concerned about the Vatican being taken over by the Nazis. And from what I've read, the Pope tried, and he has priests in Germany sneaking Jews out of Germany. He had a number of his uh, underlings involved in trying what he could to save Jews under the very tough circumstances. I've got enough controversy with Roosevelt. I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt had two Jews in his cabinet. I believe one was running Can't hear you. And all influential on you at all. I hate to start one. Can you repeat the question? Because people back there can't hear. The question was about uh, Jews in Roosevelt's cabinet. Um, Morgenthau was uh, the only Jew in the uh, cabinet, but there were a number of other Jewish advisors. Samuel Rosamond was extremely close to the president. Uh, Roosevelt trusted him with his legacy, the, the papers, and Felix Frankfurter was very close to the president. Roosevelt trusted him with establishing a Roosevelt Memorial. Um, did they have influence? Um, yes and no. They certainly had access, and Rabbi, Rabbi Wise had occasional access to the president. They could get his attention. They could uh, raise issues, but Franklin Roosevelt was uh, thought of himself as the power above everybody else, uh, the man who could see the whole picture above everybody else. Very difficult to talk Roosevelt into something that he didn't particularly want to do or didn't think it was in the interest of the United States and President Roosevelt to do. When Morgan thought took the case for the War Refugee Board to the president. Roosevelt was ready for it. He was ready militarily, and he was ready for it politically. He had already come to the conclusion that he should have done something earlier, and that's why he acted in January of 1944. What was the role of his, of his uh, what influence, if any, did his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, have on his family? We always get that question, too, and I always disappoint people on that. <laughs> I, I'm aware that Eleanor Roosevelt has millions of admirers, and she was a major force on civil rights issues and a wide range of other liberal issues. Unfortunately, not on this one. The one bill that she supported was the Wagner-Rogers bill to admit uh, 20,000 Jewish children uh, into this country outside the quota. Uh, she supported it. Her husband kept his mouth closed uh, because he thought it wasn't going to go anywhere in Congress, and he turned out to be right. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a daily newspaper column. She first mentioned Nazi persecution of the Jews in 1943. And she wrote, she didn't know what else could be done other than to win the war as quickly as possible. And that was, in fact, the State Department line that a lot of people are so critical of today. 